competition pictures. Very recently, actually, for this woman, Pamela Coleman Smith, also known as Pixie Smith. She died in 1951 at the age of 73. She wasn't on the list. Nobody had suggested her before, and I had to look her up. And when I did, I discovered that she was the illustrator of the most successful and famous tarot card deck of all time, the Rider Waite Tarot Card Deck. She was born in Manchester, which is where I was born in the late 19th century, and then moved around a lot. She moved to Jamaica, then to Brooklyn, New York, and then back to England again. She was a trained illustrator. She illustrated a whole bunch of books. And when she was in England, she designed scenery for plays in the theatre. She worked with Bram Stoker, you know, the guy who wrote Dracula, and also Sir Henry Irving. And then she went to live in Cornwall and basically ran out of money and died there. But in 1901, she became involved in something called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which is a society investigating the occult, I think. And it was there that she met someone called Arthur Waite. He commissioned her to illustrate a bunch of tarot cards, which were then published by uh, a printing company called Rider and Sons. And there you had the Rider Waite tarot card deck which has been called other things over the years, but it sold 100 million copies, is widely popular. I know nothing about tarot at all. Even when I watch tarot videos like Lena Rodriguez and other people on YouTube, I have really no clue what they're saying. <laughs> it's like, okay, don't tell me what pentacles mean or anything. Just tell me what you predict. But uh, I guess they're an occult thing, judging by this. Uh, what was a shame was that Pixie Smith died in Cornwall pretty penniless. I think they had to auction off her belongings simply to pay her debts. And she died in obscurity and missed out on all the money that her product would make later on. So I went into her energy based on this picture. It's really one of the few that exists of her. And when I did, she was falling. But there were strings of gossamer like clotheslines on the way down and she was catching on them. She would hit one, bounce off it, go down, hit the next one, bounce off it. She was on a decline of some kind. And these lifelines were stopping her from falling too heavily. I have no idea what those might be about, but something was stopping her plummeting to the ground. But she did hit the ground quite hard. And when she did, she saw ahead of her a hole, almost like when you go into a forest and you see a big hole under a tree, and obviously some animal lives under there. She saw that and thought, oh, what a delight it would be to have the liberation from this difficult world and to go into that space, just to disappear. She must have felt lonely, isolated, as well as penniless and forgotten. She went into the hole, dragged herself in. She may have had some kind of mental problem. I mean, she was a brilliant illustrator, but she may have had some kind of mental disturbance going on or a death wish or depression. It's like, I can't take this anymore. I gotta go, I want to die now. That was the feeling of crawling into this hole. But the passageway, she was at the tunnel she was crawling into, was very long and thin. She dragged herself along on her elbows. Halfway down the tunnel, there was a light. And for some reason, this brought her relief. It was almost like, oh, I'm not alone. There is somebody else here. Because otherwise, who would be maintaining this light? She carries on crawling past the light down the tunnel. And at the end, she emerges into a space. It was a bit like the top of, well, a hard-boiled egg, actually, when you take the top off, but more like a volcanic crater. It wasn't death. She was just at a new stage. And below her was something that could have been a dome, something, but it was covered in a thick mist. And it was here... 
as she looked in this crater at this mist, that she goes, uh, I'm now scared of this. I don't know where this is going to lead. The uncertainty of what lay ahead gave her second thoughts. And she thought, no, 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 okay, I've seen enough, I'm going back. But the hole had gone. Whatever mental condition had taken her this far wasn't about to loosen its grip. And there was nowhere else to go. Couldn't go back, didn't know what was in the mist, couldn't go forward. She was trapped. And she just sort of put her arms out and went, okay, and fell into it, expecting to drop and drop and drop and probably die. She didn't. There was a shallow dome inside the mist, a bit like the top of an atrium. When you go into a building and they have an atrium, a bit like that. She just went thud onto it. Still didn't die. The cave that I always see, that um, symbolic pictorial cave, metaphorical cave, was down below. But she couldn't reach it. By this point, I felt that she wanted it to end. She had had enough of this torment, this torture. And even as she was thinking this, the glass of the dome she was on, the atrium, began to crack and splinter. The way windows in movies crack and splinter, because they're made of sugar, it was like it was made of sugar almost. And under her weight, her desire to end this, it slowly cracked. And then she fell. But that wasn't the end of it. There was another tunnel that she had to go through. She fell into that, went along, and then she landed in the cave I always see. She had got her wish, but, you know, really, be careful what you wish for here. She got her wish and she was finally dead. But this had been the longest process. This woman was fascinated by death and showed more reverence for it, I think, than most other people I've done. It's almost like she was studying it or she was entranced by it or something like that. Because when she went up the tunnel, there's always a tunnel that leads up to the light. She was in no hurry to go. She wanted to ruminate on the process. And it became quite clear that whatever mental issues she may have had prior to death were gone now, obviously, because uh, she was in consciousness now. There was no uh, problem like she'd had in form. In her consciousness, she had great clarity. And she considered as she went what she was going through. There was a zigzag path up the tunnel. This was real reverence, respect. And when she got to the top of the tunnel, which took a while in the pictures, this whole thing took me about five hours, I think, to get through. Um, when she got to the top of the tunnel, there wasn't a dome this time. There was just a patch of very bright light, shifting light. And suddenly, everything that had concerned her dissipated, evaporated, leaving her calm, at one with herself, satisfied, that her inquiring mind had got the answers it needed. And with a sense of harmony, equanimity, that few have at this point, she simply walked ahead into the shifting lights and she became white light too. Which of course we all are in our essence. We are all light. We're all part of this ocean of divinity. She knew that. It felt very gratifying, actually. She got what she wanted. But boy, it was torture getting there. And that's what I got for Pamela Coleman Smith. But then I thought, 
I wonder what happens if you go into the energy of one of the cards in the Rider weight deck. So I chose this one. It seems so fitting somehow. <laughs> you fool! Yes, I know. <laughs> but I chose this one. And when I went into the energy of it, I got nothing. Just a blank space. If I did the original ones that she had drawn, maybe I would get a different energy, but this is just a piece of printed card. It had no energy of its own, and I assume tarot readers bring their own energy to it. But I almost gave up at that point, actually, but then I realized that, in fact, and this is really fascinating, in fact, it wasn't blank. It was simply the way I was looking at it, the angle. And what looked like a card was a doorway. And if I moved around, I could see a doorway beyond that doorway. This was a portal of some kind. Remember when I used to do works of art? And I could go into the painting, but I could also sometimes see the room in which it was painted and hear noises and see what people are doing. That was always really interesting. Well, it was the same with this, really. I walked, that's me. I walked into the doorway and I could hear my feet uh, echoing on wooden floorboards, as if you were in a closet, actually, as if you were walking through a wardrobe or something. Uh, and then there was this Narnia-like thing at the other side. I walked through into a corridor. And at the end of the corridor, there was a set of stairs. Uh, and it went kind of up and up and up. There were like three flights of stairs. And um, this way, there were two doors, I think, maybe facing each other, which is as far as I could go. Maybe that's where she painted them, perhaps? I don't know. But that's what was through that card. It doesn't relate to the interpretation of the card. I'm assuming. But it certainly had that extra dimension to it, that extra realm behind it that I hadn't expected. 